Welcome to the Calder Farmstead. Now the ice hogs back out to center in transition. Carlson with Quinville two on one. Right wing cross across the Quinville scores. Here's a chance for Perry. Fighting scores on the face off. It's Eminger. Go back to Wierenski. Has it. Shoots one. Bounces off a man. Five seconds left. Wierenski. Another jam on the shot. Turning and firing. Now, with nine minutes gone in overtime, the Bears breaking out right side with Bear. Looks like cutting to the net. Bear, let's go! Let's go! Let's go! And here are your hosts, CeCe and Sean. Hello and greetings from the mile high city of Denver, Colorado. And Trois Rivier, Quebec. Ah, looks like Sean's going to be stuck in French Canada for a while. Welcome to the Calder Farmstead Podcast, episode number 79 for Tuesday, February 1st. 2022. If you were hoping for a podcast featuring tips and tricks for frost seeding pastures, we are not going to be much help. This is an American Hockey League podcast. My name is CeCe Hockley, the AHL editor of Full Press Hockey. And I'm Sean O'Brien from Stats Track and the AHL's only league-wide analytics guy. And as always, we thank you for tuning in with us. And if you're new to hearing CeCe and I talk about hockey, We're going to recap some of the matchups from the past weekend in the AHL for you. We both watch a lot of AHL games, and we uh, are going to talk about what we see when we watch the film, as well as use some advanced stats to help us break it down. If that's new to you, you may want to head over to our podcast or our podcast feed or YouTube channel, wherever you're listening to us from, and check out episode zero. You got to scroll a good ways at this point, uh, but it is all the way there at the bottom, and it's a short primer on some of the stats we're going to be talking about, as well as how we view what's important on the ice. So if you're new to some of the more advanced hockey stats terms like PDO or the point shares model or newer hockey terms like controlled zone entries, go check that out so you better be able to pick up what we're putting down. I promise it's not that nerdy or technical. It's only 20 minutes. And let's be honest, you wasted 20 minutes today playing Wordle instead of Gordle. You'll never get that time back. So next time, why not spend a little more time with us talking hockey? I don't know how to play either of those games, but I'm guessing Gordle is the hockey equivalent of Wordle. That is correct. Ah, as if the Gord, I'm like, Gordy? Gordy Howe, maybe? Yeah. All right. Well, let's start off the show by going over our picks from the weekend prior. The weekend pick as we call this segment. For the first time this season, one of us has won back-to-back weeks in the pick and that would be yours truly. 18 of 28 for a 64.3% success rate. Sean, of course, never close behind. 16 of 28 at a clip of 57.1%. Um, I'm going to say my bold pick of Charlotte upsetting Utica probably helped. I mean, it was one of the picks that helped put me over the edge. So got to got to say that. But Sean, kudos to you for picking Rockford over Chicago. Zero to zero through regulation. Uh, Rockford winning it in the shootout. One to nothing. Really glad we didn't cover that series. That (laughs) probably would have been a painful game to watch. Yes, absolutely. Lastly, the model. We both beat the model this week. So, yay, we beat the machines. 14 of 28 at a clip. Or, sorry. Yeah, 14 of 28 for an even 50% positive pick rate. Overall records this season so far. Me, 120 out of 232. That's 51.7%. Uh. Sean, 133 of 263, that's 50.6%, so pretty close. The model, 124 of 235 picks, that is 52.8%. The model, of course, beating Sean and I. The machine overall is still winning. I hold a 5-3 and three record against Sean uh, in weeks pick em. Of course, Sean is 3-5 and five against... Well, he's actually three and six because Paige, when she filled in for me, she is one and oh. And Sean asked me, he goes, why don't you include Paige's picks in yours? And uh, my answer, I couldn't really recall, but now I know why. is because Paige actually beat Sean and I don't want it to short her of that. So yeah, we need so to have Paige back on the show so I get some vengeance here. <laughs> we we need to get her in. Yeah, it's uh, she's uh, I think she's free one of these Thursdays, so I'll have to reach out to her. But uh Anyways, those are the pickums, and I'm glad that we delayed recording until late Tuesday because we have a trade. We have a trade, and it's quite a notable one because we covered Syracuse, we covered Milwaukee, and guess what? Tampa Bay and Nashville, those 
teams, NHL parent clubs have initiated a trade. So you've got the Lightning acquiring Anthony Richard from Nashville and the Predators acquiring Jimmy Huntington. So, so quite a big trade here. Sean, second trade of the day, but this one actually a meaningful one at the AHL level, but probably only there. I don't think either ever become everyday NHLers, unfortunately. Sean, let's dig in a little deeper. Who do you think won this trade first and foremost? I, I think Syracuse slash Tampa pretty clearly win this trade. Um, Huntington a bit younger than Richard. Uh, I believe he's 23 to Richard, who's 26, I want to say off the top of my head. Um, but Huntington's a decent skater, has some puck skills, uh, more of a high motor, high effort kind of guy, uh, like a third line, fourth line energy uh, bringer, will throw his body around, doesn't have a lot of awareness off the puck, um, gets involved in the play, but only seems to kind of see and think about the play that's directly in front of him. Not terribly good at scanning over his shoulder or playing, you know, heads up away from the puck in the offensive zone. Um, he'll usually in the offensive zone go and support the play directly, which is good, but he also doesn't find soft ice or set up kind of uh, plays that are more than the ones that are right in front of him. He turns a lot of, you know, attacking pucks back into possession pucks. He's not making a lot of uh, extending plays or anything like that. He kind of just makes the play that's there to be made. Uh, hustles, skates hard, back checks hard and hits stuff. Like, I don't think there's a whole lot of upside there, um, but he's a decent bottom six AHLer is what it looks like to me. Uh, Tony Rick, on the other hand, uh, Anthony Richard, uh, has been very up and down this season. I believe before this weekend, the model had him as a replacement level grade, uh, which is... A little surprising, but also not terribly surprising uh, as the Admirals as a whole have been very up and down and kind of out of sorts. Um, Tony Rick at least has one viable NHL skill that you can point to and be like, that's at least something that stands out about his game, and that's his skating. That guy can absolutely fly when he turns the Jets on. He has good puck skills and tight for the AHL level, decent pl uh, playmaking vision. Good offensive awareness. Um, he struggled with effort level a little bit times this season. There have definitely been moments where he's kind of uh, glided and gone straight legged uh, when I really wish he would have picked it up. Um, but that's true of most of the Admirals team throughout points during this season. Uh, when he's on, though, Richard can be a difference maker at the AHL level. Uh, but this season has struggled a bit with consistency. Um, but as we'll get to this weekend, I really liked him this weekend and Huntington, not as much. Uh, so I, I think it's pretty clear Tampa wins this trade. Um, I really don't know what Nashville was trying to do here. Uh, here, seeing some of the analysis from, uh, our friends at the Super Bowl nation, uh, Nashville page, uh, on the forecheck, uh, they said that they thought that, you know, Nashville would move on from Richard this year. This may be an attempt to try and get something for what was going to be an inevitable parting of ways. But at the same point, did you get something that was super valuable? Like, I, I, I don't know what they thought they were acquiring here besides just, we didn't let Tony Rick go for free. And that is in itself something. Jimmy Huntington is 23, Anthony Richard 25. 25. So, but and and both of these guys are in contract years. Like Huntington is making a little over eight um eight hundred thousand, you know, eight hundred and nine thousand and you know, some change. And Anthony Richard is making league minimum, seven hundred and fifty thousand. Of course, NHL numbers, AHL numbers are gonna be different. But Let's see if we can find the NHL numbers really quickly here. Keep talking. I will look them up. No worries. No worries. But the fact is that, you know, it just, yeah, it's a bit of a, if both of these guys are in a contract year, it is a bit of a head scratcher. And I don't know, like the numbers, you know, they, they don't jump off the page. I know Richard has been in the Nashville system, if you want to call it that. I mean, He's not a prospect anymore. I mean, he's right on that age, you know, 25 years old and one, two, three, four, five seasons with Milwaukee, one with Chicago last year, of course, because Milwaukee didn't play 
but you know, he's only got two games in with Nashville. So it's like, yeah, maybe Nashville trying to get something, but Jimmy Huntington, uh, Huntington's AHL salary, 70 K Richard's is a hundred K. So mm. you saved 30, 30 grand less than that actually, because on the per day it's going to be, yeah. But like, I don't think that had any factor in it at all, but yeah, uh, that's, I don't know. I, that's the only thing I could think of for Nashville making moves here is, you know, you, you tried to get something for Anthony Richard and Jimmy Huntington was the best you could really realistically hope for. He's young. Maybe there's some development there that can still be done, but that seems a little unlikely. Uh, there was another AHL trade that at least that Tampa uh, slash Syracuse, I guess you could say made, but Ty Fellhaber for an ECHL guy is not a not worthy of really diving into. There's not much there. And Fellhaber automatically getting assigned to ECHL Orlando immediately after the trade. So yeah. this is the yeah, borderline ECHL trade at that point. I did make a passing mention of it, but yeah, it was it was pretty quick. But uh but yeah, um two left-handed centermen getting traded between essentially Syracuse and Milwaukee, who we both covered uh, this weekend. So that was uh, very fortuitous that A, we delayed this recording for a little bit, and B, we covered both of those teams. So thank you, Tampa Bay and Nashville, for making that trade. It makes our lives a little bit uh, easier. For once, we're going to do the scooping instead of hey. getting scooped. You're right. It happened one time. One All time. Right. We will – hopefully it's part of a trend. But uh, – Anyway, let's uh, let's get to the weekend recap, the weekend that was in the AHL. And, of course, we're going to start in the Atlantic Division, and we're going to start with the Hershey Bears. They played against Bridgeport on Saturday at 7 p.m. They also played against Lehigh Valley Sunday at Lehigh Valley at 5.05 p.m. local time. Uh, real quick, let's talk Friday, Bridgeport. Let's talk Saturday, Lehigh Valley. Break it down, Sean. Uh, let's quickly go over the just kind of box score thing here. Uh Friday night, Thomas Hickey breaks a scoreless game in the third after activating off the blue line into the slot. Kobar Dro and Jeff Kubiak get the assists just over two minutes later. The Bears see all good things that happen when you have one-time options on the power play as Shane Gersich blasts one past Skarik, Massey and Brown on the assists. Uh, and the, hit, the hits from those one-timers on the power play just keep rolling as Mike Vecchione doesn't let Gersich have all the fun, blasts one uh, uh, one-timer for the OT winner. Uh, Axel Janssen, Fialabi, and Mark uh, and Johansson are on the assists. Bears win two to one in overtime over the Sound Tigers. On Saturday, uh, Johansson botches fielding the puck off the boards, and Charlie Gerard finds Cal O'Reilly in front of the net for a shorthanded goal to open the scoring. Vecchioni finds a rare mistake from the Phantoms' PK as they don't get in his shooting lane in time, and he puts one in on the power play against his former team. Assist from Axel Janssen, Fialabi, and Johansson again. Uh, Vecchione isn't done as he gets a tip on a Hail Mary shot uh, from the point by Johansson. Pinho picks up the second assist there. Bad line change and a poor effort from Jake Massey allows Cal O'Reilly to bank his second shorthanded goal of the game. Linus Sandin and uh, Hogberg on the assist there. Linus is Sandin and Hogberg, both <laughs> named Linus on the assist there. Uh, Linus Sandin isn't done though as late in the third period, he puts one home on the doorstep late in the third. Garrett Wilson and Jackson Cates on the assists. Hershey isn't able to amount the comeback and the Phantoms take it three to two. And to talk about what we chose, who we picked before the game, myself, Sean and the model all said Hershey sweeps. And the model said Hershey is a 52.4% favorite over Bridgeport and a 53.7% favorite over Lehigh Valley. They got the job done against the AHL's mm, Island Sound Tigers. <laughs> you, go. you were close. You, second uh, part, you got it. Mm, mm -hmm. I had you in the first half, not going to lie. But uh, Lehigh Valley, they did not, uh, even though they were a little bit more of a favorite against Lehigh Valley than Bridgeport. In our weekend preview, we said one of the keys to the weekend for the Bears was the power play, as they had zero power play goals against either Bridgeport or Lehigh Valley on the season, and that needed to change. How did the Bears power play look, Sean? Well, last year we gave them a lot of grief for not having guys play on their offsides on the half wall so they can one-time pucks. Uh, Vecchioni and Gersich both scored power play goals 
doing this exact thing we've been saying for over a calendar year. Um, <laughs> although, uh, overall, though, I, I thought they looked a lot better Saturday than Sunday, but I think that has a bit to do with who was active on Friday and the PK they faced. But I was pleased overall. Uh, the power play in general had good puck movement, attack from the inside, was looking across Royal Road. Also, Brian Pinho power play time. Uh, so always a good thing. Uh, my our, our, our boy Brian Pinho closer to being free every single day. Uh, but I will say, um, I don't think these good times on the power play are going to continue. Yeah, yeah, because um, our Christmas gift that we gifted and our holiday episode of health to the Hershey Bears, it seems to have gotten lost in the mail. Uh, the post office really just not getting it done these days. Alex Alexiev, Garrett Pilon, and Mike Scarbosa all leaving Saturday's game with injuries. Obviously, the outcome is indicative with the Phantoms taking the win, but how did that play out on the ice for Sunday's game against Lehigh Valley? It's strange, Cece. You'd think with McElrath and Whitcow and uh, Kale Kessie that the deterrence for other teams taking liberties and hurting the Bears' top players would be at an all-time high. And Mm. yet, where was that when Scarboza got boarded and left with a shoulder injury that's probably going to cost him time on the IR? Mm. Where was that deterrence? Where was that protection? McElrath was on the ice. Man, it's almost like having those guys on your roster doesn't do anything. Weird. Who could have seen that coming? As to your question, uh, how did it impact the game for against the Valley? About what you'd expect. Uh, replacing those guys with a group of ECHLers is always going to go poorly. But I think the Bears miss Alexiev the most of that crew. And that's not to, you know, say less of Pilon or Scarbosa, as both are big elements of the offense in their own right. But without Alexiev, uh, Lucas Johansson is the only one who can really move the puck in transition. And he's not that great at it. Uh, the lack of good breakouts and the ability to beat the first four checker meant a lot of dump and chase from Hershey in Alexiev's absence. And as we've talked about in episode zero and many, many episodes since then, dump and chains can jump, dump and chase can be effective when your team is built specifically for it. When you have a lot of guys who have good team speed, they set up the, you know, the dump retrievals well, where they're racing before the puck gets slapped in. They're physical, able to win battles along the boards. That's not the Bears, by and large, as a team. Like, they have a handful of guys who have individual parts of those skills, but, you know, your bottom six guys are not fast enough to be getting there for dump-ins. They're not timing their jumps with the dump-in. It's a bit of a mess, and this led to a lot of nothing happening in the offensive zone because the Bears couldn't recover the dump-ins, get possession, and create scoring chances against Lehigh Valley from inside home plate. And that's the name of the game, shooting pucks from dangerous areas in the offensive zone. And the Bears, without, you know, Alexiev to help them start the uh, transition going the other way, as well as not having your higher end skill guys, the HL level like Pilon and Scarbosa, they weren't able to generate offense from the high danger areas. And well, we saw two very low scoring kind of bad effort, not bad efforts, but bad results from the Hershey offense because it takes talent to move the puck into those areas and to move the puck, you know, in transition and the bears lack that. Um, and that's why we saw the bears struggle to create many scoring chances off the cycle in transition. Um, so that really kind of tells the story of how the bears uh, only managed to score a handful of goals this weekend. Yeah. And real quick, before we kind of, dive further into the individual players for the Bears and how they did this weekend. I know we've had this conversation before. I covered Kale Kessie when he played for the Idaho Steelheads. And obviously Hershey is deploying him as an enforcer type. You know, he is, he does have some offensive capability though. And it just kind of boggles my mind how he can be almost a point per player guy. Um, You know, granted, yes. Did he fight in Idaho? Absolutely. Did he fight at the ECHL level? Absolutely. But I feel like the Steelheads really like kind of helped foster some more of his offensive talent and, you know, side of the puck where he was, you know, potting about an equal amount of, of goals and assists, you know, so I don't know, maybe that doesn't translate over to the AHL level very well. Yep. There it is. Yeah. Nailed it. So right away. Got it right away. <laughs> That's one of the things that I think is the biggest difference between the jumps between leagues mm-hmm. is the, and, and you see it a lot in other sports too, like the stuff that works in college football for some players. Like I always think of Johnny Manziel. Johnny Manziel, mm-hmm. when he was at Texas A&M, could, you know, 
make these big bootleg sweeps around the defensive ends and defensive linemen and linebackers because he was fast enough to do that because, you know, these were guys who were future enterprise employees and not first round draft picks in the NFL. <laughs> and when he got to the NFL and tried to outrun NFL defensive ends to the corner, it went very, very poorly for him. And that's what you see from a lot of guys, you know, who are point per game players, the ECHL who get called up. And in some cases, a lot of guys who are veterans, I mean, I think of Martin Furk, like Martin Furk mm. at the AHL level is like a, a roughly point of game player. So is, you know, Scarbosa, Pilon, et cetera. You send them up to the NHL level and it's that they can't do that level of production or even close to it anymore because the aspects in which they excel at, at the speed, the AHL is played and the time and space that they're given doesn't exist when you, you know, when everyone is suddenly just as good as you were better at a lot of those skills. And that's what you see from guys like Kale Cassie, like, Cassie, when you give him all that space and all that time, and he only has to make, you know, maybe find a little bit of soft ice and can just overpower goaltenders or defensemen with a little bit of skating or a little bit of uh, crafty hands. Like you can't do that at the AHL level. You definitely can't do it at the NHL level, given where his skill set is. And that's true of a lot of guys. They're good at one th aspect of hockey. We talked about Anthony Richard, his NHL skill is skating. Uh, Martin Furks is, you know, shot velocity. But like the guys who are at the top of the NHL level have more than that. Like Matt Barzell isn't doesn't have a, an elite singular talent in his toolbox. But what he does have is the ability to put all of them on top of each other. He has very good hands with very good edge work with very good vision. And he can put all of them into one play at the same time. And that's what makes him better than everyone else is because he can do all of the things that he can do at his fastest speed possible. Same thing with McDavid and somewhat dry side, although he's not as great a skater, but like though that's what separates them from the pack is that they have a lot of really good skills and they can do all of them at top speed. And that's not true of guys like FERC and Pilon and in this case, Kale Kessie, and even in that transition from the ECHL to the AHL. They have all the ingredients to make a really, really good sandwich. Whereas some guys just have, you know, maybe the pastrami is out of this world, but you know, you put in the cheese and the bread and everything. You just don't have a good hockey sandwich. <laughs> I don't know. That, that, yeah. <laughs> Some guys can, you know, make you a, a, a beautiful sandwich with uh, artisanal lettuce and mm. cheese. Other guys are, you know, handing you some grilled cheese and that's good enough. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes grilled cheese will, it'll get you through, man, for sure. Yeah. All right. Well, hey, from the player side, like I was leading into and, and great, great description there, by the way. Um, who on the Hershey side stuck out to you in one way or another? I really liked what I saw from Shane Gersuch this weekend. A uh, few big opportunities on offense was noticeable on defense in a good way, which we don't get to say that often about forwards. Usually if we're bringing them up on defense, it's the you dogged it here and there kind of thing. Um, and Hershey is going to need guys like that to step up, uh, especially as more and more players come out of the lineup. Uh, I think Hershey is uniquely positioned almost in the AHL where taxi squads are allegedly set to expire here in a couple days and Hershey is going to gain absolutely nothing from it. Uh, the only people in their, the Capitals taxi squad right now uh, are Hunter Shepard and Lucas Johansson. And they had Lucas Johansson this weekend already. And Hunter Shepard is not going to factor into their future in a significant way, hopefully. Um, so even with the taxi squads evaporating, they're still going to need guys like Shane Gersich to step up. Uh, and at least from, you know, a two game sample size of Gersich getting more minutes and more playing time, he looks ready to answer the call. Uh, it probably also goes without saying, but Copley was great on Saturday and has been solid in his last few starts. If the bears are going to continue to grind through this season, Fukali and him are going to have to be on fire. And at least from Phoenix Copley, uh, this is probably the best stretch he's played in two plus years. Uh, he was ready and answered the call multiple times against Bridgeport he managed to reach behind him and rob Chris Terry of a puck that I have absolutely – like, I watched the replay of this seven or eight times. I still do not know how he got that puck before Chris Terry. But that's how it's going to work out sometimes. Um, speaking of Zach Fukali, I thought he played fine. Uh, two backdoor goals and a shorthanded breakaway that Massey absolutely stopped skating on are not really on him. Um, a lot of people, it seems like, get caught up with looking at just the pure – number of shots he faced and the number of saves he made. 
and don't look at the quality of them. But then, you know, thumb their nose at analytics when you're looking at raw counting stats and not quality of shot. But that's a story for another time. I thought Fucali uh, wasn't amazing, but he played fine. That loss is not on him to Lehigh Valley. It's on the defense for the ungodly number of miscues in transition that they had. And that, again, comes back to the first point we talked about of defensemen, you know, not being able to move the puck in transition. It was amazing how many times guys just tried to pick up the puck off the boards and flubbed it. And then the whole play broke down because then suddenly they felt pressure from four checkers or anything like that. And it all falls apart. That first touch, when you put your puck on the stick, how well you're able to control it definitely determines a lot of the outcome of the rest of the play. Uh, Massey was guilty of that. Dylan McElrath has been guilty of it for a year and a half now. Um, And it's unless Hershey can get, you know, Nardella or, I mean, there's, I guess, an outside chance that Martin Farivari comes back. Uh, but unless they're getting some of those guys who can actually make plays in transition and not just fling it from behind their goal line to get tipped into the zone for a dump attempt on a controlled breakout, they're going to continue to struggle to make offense, I think. Yeah, I did notice the Bears on January 30th signed uh, Tariq Hammond to a professional tryout, the pride of the University of Denver, (laughs) or at least an alum of the University of Denver. So yeah, I mean, definitely coming in, trying to to get some backup as much as they can with these injuries that are coming in. Um, Yeah, just just a rough go at it. With that said, um, where does Hershey go from here? Nowhere good, I'm afraid. Uh, (laughs) Hershey is back to the skeleton crew, and somehow the taxi squad, like we talked about, is not going to net them much of anything. Um, they host Hartford midweek, uh, and the Rangers just sent, uh, I want to say three players back from the taxi squad to Hartford that are going to play very likely on Wednesday. Uh, so that's not great, uh, for an uh, outlook for Hershey. Um, after that, the bears head to Cleveland, which is at least a good break for them as Cleveland has played down to its competition and then some all season. Uh, so Hershey being down guys shouldn't kneecap them as badly as it would against a better team than the Cleveland Monsters. Um, so they at least have that to look forward to, but they're probably going to face an uphill battle for the most of the future of their schedule uh, in the short term because Hartford is getting loaded up again. Springfield's going to get loaded up again. Providence, the, you know, the rest of their division is going to get a lot better of a return from their taxi squad than Hershey is. Uh, and with all of the injuries they have. And apparently now TJ Oshie went from being like maybe cleared to play this past weekend to no, he's actually more week to week. So like it just, the hits just keep on coming for Hershey. It's. Yeah. It's the, it's the smash mouth meme. Well, the years start coming and they don't stop coming and they don't stop coming. Well, the yeah, the injuries start coming and they don't stop coming and they don't stop coming for Hershey. So. Yeah. Anyways. uh, We are, that is all we have for the Hershey Bears. We're going to take a break here. After the break, we are going to head and talk about the Syracuse Crunch. Uh, If you're just here for the Hershey Bears, thank you for stopping by. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you're listening to us from so you get episodes in a timely fashion. Also check us out on social media. Uh, Links to our social media is links to all of our popular podcast catchers and our YouTube channel. Uh, can be found on our Linktree page at l-i-n-k-t-r dot e-e slash the Calder Farmstead. We're going to pay some bills, run some ads. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Okay, from the Atlantic Division to the North Division, we head to Syracuse, New York. Or at least uh, we're covering their team in the crunch. Friday at 7.05 p.m. at Rochester and Saturday at 7 p.m. versus the Charlotte Checkers. The weekend that was for the Syracuse Crunch, Sean, real quick, Friday and Saturday, give us a quick rundown of how those games went for Syracuse. All right, Friday, Alex Green breaks the ice in the second period as he crashes the net and bangs home a rebound. Remy Ellie and Dumont on the assists. Ryan McInnes ties it up a bit over five minutes of game time later as he throws one at the front of the net and Miftikov tries to paddle it down but puts it between his legs and in. Unfortunate bounce there. Uh, the Crunch PK continues to bite them with their passive in-zone play as they give Ethan Prow time and space to operate, and he starts the sequence that leads to McInnes' game-winning goal with seven seconds left in the third. Mershon Prow on the assist. That would be final 2-1 for the Rochester Americans. Saturday, 
Scott Wilson makes a nice play as he attacks down the slot and Colin finds him. Wilson buries it to get the checkers on the board first. Goaltender Spencer Knight picks up the second assist somehow. Hmm. Uh, Scott Wilson strikes again as he does his best Pavel Datsuk impression and strips Charles Houdon from behind in the offensive zone, turns around and deeks and tucks at five hole. The checkers pile it on as Henry Bowlby and Alexi Heponiemi put the checkers up four nothing before Sean Day has a point shot that finds its way past Spencer Knight to make it four to one. Remy Ellie and Frank Hora on the assist for Sean Day. Max McCormick puts home another from Henry Bowlby, and Scott Wilson completes the hat trick to finish the game six to one for the Charlotte Checkers. And the picks I said Rochester over Syracuse and the crunch over the Checkers. Sean, you said. You had a sneaking suspicion that Charlotte is going to get reinforcements before that game. You took the crunch over the Amherst, but the checkers over the crunch. So let's see here. Um, yeah, the Amherst got it done. And uh, the checkers got it done. Yep. Yeah. So the model, 0 for 2 there. Uh, the model had Syracuse as a favorite in both games. But the model also didn't know that Charlotte was going to have Spencer Knight. So my suspicions at least <laughs> proved good there. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, we both split our picks. I said Rochester over Syracuse. You said the crunch over the Amherst. So, yeah. I mean, we both we both split it. But, the yeah, the model was incorrect across the board. So probably one of the reasons why it went 50% for the weekend. Spencer anyway, Knight. Spencer Knight. One of our focuses on the preview of the crunch was their penalty kill. And one of the keys to the weekend was to stay out of the box until they addressed those PK issues. While we always recommend avoiding the sin bin, it was clearly more important for them. How did the crunch do in that area? They took three penalties on the entire weekend. Hey, that's not bad. That's a positive. Yeah, but they went one for three on the penalty kill over the weekend uh, mm. and went down doing the exact things we highlighted in the preview. Being too passive in zone and just staring down Ethan Prow, who assisted on the game winner. Uh, and then the other power play goal they let up was Remy Ellie doing something on the four check. I cannot identify what, but it's definitely not what he was supposed to be doing. Uh, we talked about in the preview that lack of being on the same page for the four checkers on the penalty kill. Remy Ellie was that guy uh, in that moment on their second power play goal that Charlotte scored. Um, but yeah, it was a rough weekend of penalty killing for them. And I mean, yeah, on a weekend where they went 0 for 2 in regards to game outcomes, there probably aren't a lot of positives to take away at Imagine for Syracuse right now. I actually disagree with that a little bit. Oh. Well, going 0 for 2 obviously is bad, uh, and there were definitely some breakdowns, I thought. Um, the Crunch did okay on the weekend. Uh, if you'll bear with me here, because I understand losing 6 to 1, how how is this internet man? No, 6 1 bad. <laughs> um, well, for starters, let's look at the Amherst game. Uh, they were the better team against Rochester. They controlled play, and while they didn't generate a ton of you know high da uh, high danger scoring chances, they turned the neutral zone into sludge for, you know, long stretches of time and forced a high-flying, counterattacking, finesse and flash Amherst team to play dump and chase, grinded out hockey for long stretches. Yes, there were some back and forth chance trading in the second period, but this was still, by and large, a low event dump and chase game. And that had to be the strategy for the crunch to pull out a win here. And I thought, for the most part, they executed that pretty well. I thought they had chances against the checkers and even had some moments where the ice was tilted their way in the first two periods. The difference in this game and kind of a theme throughout the games we covered this weekend as a whole is that when the crunch made mistakes, the checkers put them in the back of the nets. When the checkers made mistakes, the crunch turned them into missed opportunities. Um, and yes, that's a significant difference, but that six to one score was for at least two periods, uh, not as one-sided as you might think a six-to-one game would go. The one big head-scratcher I had for uh, Syracuse, though, was on the power play. Uh, they had Charles Houdon on his strong side, um, which means he can't one-time pucks, which is mm -hmm. extra dumb because that's literally Charles Houdon's best hockey skill. Uh, he is AHL left-handed Ovechkin for that exact reason. You stick him at the right face-off dot, 
and just let him wet, uh, wind up and slam pucks. This is what Charles Houdon is very, very good at. Um, and they decided to line him up on the other half wall. And I don't really know why, because earlier in the year, they definitely used Charles Houdon as every other team has. So a bit of a head scratcher from the coaching staff there. Don't know why they decided to switch Houdon from being able to one-time pucks. But that definitely helped uh, handicap their power play a significant amount there. Um, the talent level, too, uh, for the Crunch is going to be something that inhibits them for most of this season. Guys like Daniel Walcott, Gage Gun uh, Goncalves, PC Labrie, Sean Element, they're not really getting it done in third-line roles in a division that has Utica and Rochester that are playing guys who can score 14, 15 goals on their third line. That's also with Otto Sampi being a complete ghost too, which is a whole other problem as to the guy we saw last season has definitely not shown up in Syracuse or you know gotten on the bus for Syracuse road trips by and large uh, this season for them. Otto Sampi definitely becoming manual Sampi uh, in this instance. Uh, come on, I've made that joke before. If you want to call it a joke, you're welcome. <laughs> anyway, from the player side, Sean, who on the crunch stuck out to you in one way or another? And like you said, in spite of both losses, there are some positives. So I figured that would be the case on the player side as well. I mean, from the player side, when he wasn't killing penalties, I really liked Remielli this weekend. Uh, made a lot of good plays, including some subtle ones that helped to keep uh, help keep the play flowing in the crunch's direction. Like I said, in both games. For the majority of the Rochester game and at least good stretches through the first and second period in the Charlotte game, I thought the crunch controlled the flow of play. Remielli was a big factor in them being able to kind of tilt the ice in their direction. Alex Barry Brule continues to be the best player on the ice for every shift he took this weekend. Um, he's just got such good vision and a shot release that's just nasty. Uh, if we need any more evidence that the, Kra the Kraken are making bad roster decisions, they let Alex Barry Brule go for nothing. Uh, because he's certainly better uh, than the NHLers that are on Seattle's roster in some parts. Um, breaking into the roster for the back-to-back -back cup champs who are fourth in the NHL right now in the standings is going to be a tall task for ABB. Um, but he's certainly a better hockey player than Nathan Bastion, Riley Shahan, Colin Blackwell, Mason Appleton. And yet the Kraken went with them. And I mean, that is, that is a choice. <laughs> but... Barry Boulay really liked what I saw from him this weekend. Uh, if the crunch could clone him and put him on, you know, on the second line and the third line and the fourth line, they absolutely would. He has been a driving force for offense for them. Um, and it, it's, it's unfortunate that it seems like he can't just solidify himself on an NHL lineup because he definitely has the qualities to be an NHL player. And I really thought when uh, Seattle picked him up and I'm like, Oh, He's going to be their uh, uh, Wild Bill Carlson. He's going to be their William Carlson. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought uh, all the way through last year that the Kraken's William Carlson was going to be Daniel Sprong. Like, I was positive of it. They were going to take Sprong from the Capitals. He was going to be their, you know, 35 goal scorer or whatever. And then they picked up Barry Boulay. I'm like, that's their guy. And I think, you know, with Abbotsford coming in and their initials being ABB, I think. Yeah, like they've got territorial rights to that uh, that acronym, you know, and so they're like, oh, well, we picked him up, but, uh, you know, the Abbey Canucks filed a copyright claim, so now we got to let him go back to waivers again, but because I'm, I'm thinking that's exactly how it happened, but that's I mean, just... Yeah, I, I'm, I feel like for our time in the AHL, I've learned a little bit about trademark law in the United States. Canada, though, that, that could be true. <laughs> I... Could be a different story. I mean, Seattle's close enough to Canada to where, I don't know. Uh, grasping at straws here with, you know, fun acronyms and everything like that. Let's look forward for the Syracuse Crunch. They've got a strange two-game set on Wednesday and Friday in Ontario, Canada, speaking of the land up north, against the Belleville Senators, who are currently sixth of seven teams in the North Division, just ahead of Cleveland and just behind Syracuse. After Friday's matchup, the Crunch then head back to the States to host the Charlotte Checkers at the tail end of their five game road trip that will have featured all New York teams, Utica, Rochester, and of course, Syracuse. The crunch are 15, 15 and four. 
That's fifth in the North Division with an even 500 points percentage. All right, well, we are going to take a brief respite here. We're going to catch our breath. You know, Sean maybe is going to go shopping there in Trois-Rivières. And uh, after that, we're going to get to the Milwaukee Admirals. And if you're just here for the Syracuse Crunch, well, hey, thanks for stopping by. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you're listening to us from so you can get episodes in a timely fashion. If you're listening to a weekend you know, preview, it probably benefits you to follow up with the weekend recap as well. So why not subscribe and catch both, hell, catch all episodes in a timely fashion, like I mentioned. Also, check us out on social media, links to our social media, as well as links to our YouTube channel and popular podcast links can be found at our Linktree page at linktr.ee slash the Calder Farmstead. We are going to, um, you know, we're going to have to pay some bills here. You know, Sean staying time in Canada, you know, that exchange rate and everything. Got to make that money. So hang tight. Listen to some ads. We'll be right back. Okay, the Eastern Conference, at least the deep dive series, have been recapped here on the Calder Farmstead. It's time to talk Milwaukee. It's time to talk Central Division and Milwaukee. The Admirals, their weekend series, Friday, 7 p.m. versus Rockford. They hosted Rockford. And Saturday at 6 p.m., they hosted Grand Rapids. So, Sean, Friday and Saturday, we got some goals to recap. How did it go down for the Milwaukee Admirals? Well, Andre Altabarmakian uh, opened the scoring with a one-timer on a setup from Lucas Reichel at the bottom of the circle. Jakob Galvis, the other assist. The Admirals wouldn't get on the score sheet until the third, where Mark Del Geizo finished a Cody Glass net drive. The puck deflects off Graham not at the goal mouth, so it ends up being his goal from Del Gasso and Glass to tie the game at one early in the third period. The third finishes without a winner, so we head to OT, where Cody Glass springs... Tony Rick, Anthony Richard, now of the Syracuse Crunch for a breakaway. And Tony Rick makes no mistakes and buries one past Soderblom to take it for the Admirals in overtime, two to one. Saturday, as Tony Rick ended it on Friday off a of glass assist, he gets it started on Saturday with a power play goal from the bumper spot off a of glass assist. Uh, Tommy Novak credited with the second assist. Cole Smith gets a lucky deflection off a Davies shot from the half wall to make it 2-0 in the second. Graham Knott picks, picks up a second assist, his second point on the weekend on that one. Del Geizo tries to one-time a fluttering pass from Af Afanasiev, but he can't get all the shots, but that knuckle puck effort is good enough as it floats past Caden Fulcher to make it 3-0 Milwaukee. Tony Rick with the second assist. <laughs> The good bounces just keep coming as Cole Smith fires one on a rush chance from just above the faceoff dot that trickles behind Fulcher and Smith follows it up and taps it in behind him before the Griffins can get to it to make it four to nothing. Matt Luff stuffs, a, uh, stuffs one in on a wrap attempt from behind the net. The net was off the moorings before he started the shot, but somehow the goal stands to make it five to nothing. Grimaldi and Davies on the assists. That would be all the scoring as the Admirals sweep the weekend. Five to nothing with a win over the Grand Rapids Griffins. Yeah. And for our picks before this game, I was so tempted to go with a Milwaukee both sweep us, here. Both of us, both of us struggled. <laughs> but we both chose the Ice Hogs on Friday and Milwaukee on Saturday. Of course, the Admirals winning on Saturday in convincing fashion over the Griffins and defeating Rockford as well. So Milwaukee holding true to the model. 59% favorite over Rockford, 60% favorite over the Grand Rapids Griffins. Sean, you weren't ready to believe in the Admirals 2022 turnaround. Version 5.3 on Thursday. Has the weekend sweep changed your tune at all with what you saw from Milwaukee this weekend? Well, there are a lot of positives, so let's dive in here. Uh, yeah. They outchanced the Ice Hogs 15-7 to in the final two periods of Friday and dominated play after a very sleepy first period. That's how the Ice Hogs really take the fight to them, which I think is an important uh, aspect to point out because the Admirals have sleepwalked through periods, uh, slept walked? S I, yes, Sleep have yeah. been sleepy through periods uh, in, game, in entire games in the past. So the message got home in the first intermission. They came out with a strong second and third period. Um, I said that I wanted to see Tony Rick get it together, and he absolutely did this weekend, and then they traded him. Bye. So... <laughs> That, that one at least stings a little bit. Oh, yeah. um, Cody Glass had three assists on the weekend, so it was good to see him kind of find the score sheet again. Um, 
Grimaldi looks solid, albeit less chip on his shoulder angry than in previous games. Connor Ingram played his ass off in both games and kept the Admirals in Friday's game. And yet, despite all of these positives, I'm still hesitant. <laughs> uh, while they came back to win Friday after a sloppy first period, the not being ready at puck drop uh, concerns me a little bit. Yes, they responded, and that's good, but slow starts have plagued them all season. And to see more of that coming was concerning. Saturday's game against Grand Rapids was not the dominant 5 to nothing effort that the box score may indicate. I feel like the big difference in that game was a few good breaks. Uh, both Cole Smith's goals and Matt Luff's goal just kind of good bounces that went in your direction that probably were not uh, of the repeatable nature sorts. Uh, Cole Smith, a kind of fluttering shot uh, on the break on, on a rush chance out of the box that just gets past Caden Fulcher and he manages to beat Kyle Chris Colo to the puck that's sitting just loose behind him there. Probably not something that's going to happen, you know, uh, every so often for Cole Smith. Another one that just deflects off a shot that he wasn't, I don't think, intending to tip, just kind of hit him on the hip and goes in. Um, the other one, uh, just a fluttering puck that happens to, you know, find its way into the net. That's three goals out of the five for the Admirals that just kind of, Lock boxed their way into um, Connor Ingram played amazing though. That's not that shocking, but the fact that they kind of needed Connor Ingram to play amazing a little bit on the concerning side. Um, and kind of like I said, at the beginning of the show, uh, a theme that went through a lot of the games this weekend is when the admirals makes mistake made mistakes, Ingram covered for them. And when grand Rapids made mistakes, Caden Fulcher did not um, Nothing about Saturday's game felt like a one-sided ass beating. And yes, when you're up three to nothing at the second intermission, there's really not a lot of incentive to dominate possession and press and continue to score. Um, so you're seeing a lot of score effects into, you know, creep into the way that that game kind of played out. And that makes it a little more challenging to evaluate uh, how to feel about this team. You know, you're up three, nothing. There's no need to put, keep putting your foot on the gas or to, it, you know, you've already asserted your dominance over the other team. There's no need to, to keep doing more. And that's kind of the way the game went. Um, overall, there's a lot to like from the Admiral's efforts this weekend and that's good, but there's enough there. There are enough, you know, uh, warning signs there that still are keeping me from buying into Admiral's turnaround 5.3. Um, I do want to see more of what I saw this weekend. I'd like to see a little bit cleaner effort on the defensive effort on, on a back to back. Um, but I still think this is a ship that is, going in a better direction than it was in, in previous iterations. So if you're an Admirals fan listening to this, you have reason for optimism. Please, you know, buy in, go to games, cheer. But I, I, I at least, I, I want to see more before I'm back on their ship again. Uh, the captain Cole Schneider, he's, uh, he's, <sighs> con he's continues to have his work cut out for him. That's for sure. As the, okay, we, we, we need to talk about that. I wasn't going to bring it up, but you should never, ever, ever, like, if that game wasn't 4 nothing or 3 nothing or whatever the score was at the point that Cole Schneider tried to pass backwards on a breakaway, like, Carl Taylor would have had to call a timeout, run to Home Depot, buy an industrial nail gun so that Cole Schneider would never leave the bench again. Like, what are you doing? Okay, I did not realize that that was Cole Schneider. You showed me that clip. You showed me that clip. You're like, okay, you need to watch this. And I, you were filming it with your phone and you sent it to me over messenger. I didn't realize that was Cole Schneider. That was Cole Schneider. Oh my goodness. Yeah. The, a drop back pass on a breakaway. Just anyway. Why? There, no, <laughs> never kids. If you were watching that to learn something about how to play youth hockey and develop as a hockey player, never do that. I've seen like, three times i think in professional hockey dudes try and like you know 4d chess themselves into playing like a, a backwards pass to a teammate on a breakaway and all three of them it has failed spectacularly so i just i never understand why guys think like oh i'm gonna be the one i'm gonna be the the guy who does it successfully that like just just you have a breakaway just shoot just shoot or make a deke or something don't pass you lunatic <laughs> Moving on from the captain, moving on from Cole Schneider, let's let's mention some other players and players that stood out to you in the right ways for the Milwaukee Admirals this weekend. 
not entirely in the right way. Other okay. Cole, well, Cole Smith, uh, only played in the Grand Rapids game and scored two goals, but both kind of fluky goals as we've talked about, and they don't offset the three just face palm penalties he took that really could have thrown a lifeline to the Griffins should their power play be anything but feckless without Riley Barber. Um, Cody Glass, three assists on the weekend, had some solid moments. Also a handful of blunders in his defensive zone that kind of way down that performance from Cody Glass a little bit. I thought Tommy Apap played well in both games, given the role that he has on that team as kind of a bottom six guy. Um, the big standout to me <laughs> was Anthony Richard, <laughs> who got traded. Who got uh, traded. <laughs> really, he was just everywhere in Friday's Rockford game. Uh, when he scored the OT winner, it wasn't shocking as the more wide open style of three on three very much favors his, you know, speed-based skill set. Um, loved his hustle on back checks, which is not something that we saw from him. Created offense all night long. Uh, just, he has all the raw tools, I think, to be an NHL player at at least a fourth or third line level. But he needs to put them together in efforts like this weekend more often for that to be more of a viable, for him to be a viable everyday NHLer instead of just, Hey, we need a guy for a game. Um, good luck to him in the Tampa system. I, I think it's actually less likely that he makes the NHL playing with them because Tampa loaded, but he definitely gives something to Syracuse that they need, which is team speed and guys who can, you know, do things on the offensive side of the puck. Um, lastly, what can you say about Connor Ingram other than damn? Um, whatever the reason the Predators have for favoring David Riddich over him at this point are well beyond me. Riddich hasn't been at least an average NHL goaltender in like three seasons and continues to not look that great this year. If I were the Predators, I would deal Riddich at the deadline for whatever I can get for him. Call Ingram up and see if that Askarov guy that everyone talks about wants to sign his ELC and go to Milwaukee. I think that's probably the plan for next season. Uh, but I don't see the point in waiting as the Predators are very clearly still in win-now mode, and Ingram helps them do that more than Riddich. So... <laughs> Which is funny because Ingram came over to the Tampa Bay organization, or sorry, from the Nash... to the Nashville organization from Tampa Bay. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> and, and did so in a way that I really want to know the story behind. Because there is a story there of what happened to him in Tampa Bay, and we will never learn it. Like v vague details. Vague there details. are like whispers yeah. about it, but like some some stuff happened there, and I really want to know because it sounds like it's probably really stupid. And that makes it a lot more fun. But like Oh man. I missed opportunity when Milwaukee was in town at up in Loveland. I should have uh, went and asked Connor Ingram, said, Hey, so uh what are the dirty deets? What happened? <laughs> I, I I can't imagine that the details of that ever get out. But Probably God, not. I want them to. Because like oh, I said, yeah. I, I think that if nothing else, they will be real stupid and therefore very entertaining. Oh, so, absolutely. Uh, I mean... But we'll never know. But uh, yeah, Connor Ingram is continues to show that he is capable of being a, a, an NHL backup at some level. Way more than what David Riddich has shown this season. And someone needs to give UC Soros a break now and then, even though he's a, a Vesna candidate this year, although it's hard to take anyone over Shesterkin at this point. But that's a story for another league <laughs> that we don't cover. So Connor Ingram, man to be appearing later in this film, give you a hint. It involves pasteurization, but uh, hopefully that doesn't give too much away there. <laughs> All right, looking forward, the Admirals are on a six-game winning streak and an eight-game point streak going back to two shutout losses against Colorado in mid-January. Milwaukee currently sits fifth out of seven teams in the hotly contested middle-slash-bottom portion of the Central Division. Only 0 0.074 percentage points separate third-place Rockford from seventh-place Texas. Death division. Death division, no doubt. The ads head to Illinois to play Rockford on Wednesday, February 2nd, then host the division-leading Chicago Wolves at University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee Panther Arena on Friday and Saturday, February 5th and 6th. That will be a big litmus test to see 
if the admirals are really turning a corner or not. So, all right. Well, with that all said, Sean, I think we got one more series to cover, don't you? Yeah, we do. And we're going to take a break here before we do it. After the break, we will get to Bakersfield and Tucson. If you're just here from Milwaukee, thank you for stopping by. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you're listening to us from so you get episodes in a timely fashion. Also, check us out on social media. Links to our social media as well as links to our YouTube channel, popular podcast links. A bunch of other stuff uh, can be found on our Linktree page at L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash The Calder Farmstead. I refuse to spell that for you. You can look <laughs> wherever you're listening to us from. It will be spelled correctly there. We're going to pay some bills. We will be right back. Stay tuned. Okay, it's time for our last deep dive series of the weekend that was in the AHL. And that is going to be the Bakersfield Condors against the Tucson Roadrunners. The only series that we have, we, we covered individual teams, Hershey, Syracuse, Milwaukee. Now we cover two teams in this series, Friday and Saturday, 7 p.m. in Tucson. Both of these games, Sean, take it away. Friday and Saturday, we had some action. We had some goals. Give us a brief rundown. <laughs> Did we ever? Cooper yes. Marodi breaks the ice on the power play about halfway through the first period. Uh, Griffith and Malone on the assists. Jan Yenik gets it right back, though, as Carconi sets him up on the power play just over three minutes later. Kolya Chanik, the second assist. Dylan Holloway scores his first AHL goal to take the lead back from the Condors just five minutes later. Hamblin and Schaller on the assists. But Cameron Hebig gets it right back on the power play after Luke uh, Esposito goes to the box for hooking. Ty Emerson and Terry Broadhurst get the helpers there. A sloppy second period sees the Condors score the only goal as Seth Griffith, Seth Griffith puts one in from Marodi and Malone to make it 3-2 heading into the final frame. Lavoie helps the Condors extend the lead as he pots two goals. First one from Hamblin, second one from Nimalainen on a play that Sol Kolianichuk abandoned him at the net front to chase a hit on Nimalainen. Cam Crotty scores right after to at least keep the Roadrunners in the game and make it 5-3. Broadhurst and Hebig on the assists. Hudson Fashing scores shortly to bring the Roadrunners back to within one after a too many men penalty with the goalie pool just about killed their comeback dreams. However, that would be all the scoring as the Condors take a sloppy and score-filled game 5-4. to four. Saturday, different story. James Hamblin gets the Condors rolling right away in the second period after a scoreless first. Dylan Holloway drove to the net on the rush, and the rebound comes right to Hamblin. He puts it into a wide-open net. Tim Schaller picks up the second assist. The Roadrunners' fortunes don't improve as Seth Griffith bats a pass from Brad Malone out of the air and into the back of the net for a shorthanded goal and a 2-0 lead for the Condors. Things finally start to bounce the Roadrunners' way in the third period as Cam Hebig gets a good bounce off the glove of Konovalov and into the net to make it 2-1. Michelli and Deneen on the assists. The good bounces continue for the Roadrunners as a bounce off the end wall comes right to Ben Wings McCartney and he bangs a power play goal past a sprawling Marcus Nimalainen as Konovalov uh, had left the net to play the puck that never came. Ben McCartney completes the comeback in overtime as he finishes a rush chance, cutting across the slot, and roofs one over the glove of Konovalov for the game winner, 3-2 Roadrunners in overtime. McCartney, really a man on the run. I tell you what, man. He was... Ah, <laughs> ah so... I picked Tucson on Friday and Bakersfield on Saturday. You know, the old Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde sort of thing, but I had it backwards. Sean, you said Tucson's been a mess. You predicted a Condor sweep, but the Roadrunners, as always, surprising us with their dual personality and uh, going at least taking one on Saturday night. The model also picked it a Baker pick, picked it. <laughs> the model also picked a Bakersfield sweep, 52.2% favorite in both games. But as I've said a number of times already, the Roadrunners won in overtime on Saturday. So in the preview, we discussed Bakersfield and the recent success that they have had. You said you weren't totally convinced that they were a real, they could have been a contender. You thought they were, you might have, you know, maybe thought they were, weren't a real contender. They weren't. Did this weekend do anything to change your mind? Not really. Uh, huh. Sloppy game on Friday by both teams. The Condors needed Tucson to commit some serious blunders on defense in order to score. And while, yes, Tucson's defensive zone problems have persisted all season, uh, going forward, other teams in the specific, in the, the specific, the Pacific, 
won't just gift wrap these chances to the Condors. So, yes, judging off of a one game sample here, maybe not the you know best analysis, but like if we're looking at how solid is this team going forward, those are the nits I'm going to pick. Mm. Uh, their <laughs> penalty kill, I did not like at all. Um, very passive in zone and is lucky that they only let up three power play goals because they certainly bled chances to Tucson because of it. Also, um, if you don't want to get called for a bunch of penalties, don't put your stick in someone's midsection. Uh, that's hooking. That's the correct call. Or Just spearing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the one area that stood out for the Condors was their physicality. They were far and away the most physical team of the two this weekend. They did chase some some they did chase some hits. Uh, Samarukov had one in particular that was bad, but for the most part, were finishing checks across the board, which I thought was good, especially because I don't think of that as being a big part of their game. But they brought the physicality to Tucson, who I usually think of as being the more physical team. Um, I also don't know what the plan for Staylock is. Uh, I thought he looked okay on Friday and definitely had some good saves, albeit the defense did not do him any favors. But Smith and Koskinen are still in the mix in Edmonton. Moonshine kind of going between the two when needed. Konovlov and Rodrigue are still young prospects who need playing time. Um, Staylock is 34. I can't imagine he fetches anything on the trade market. So hmm. I, I, I don't have a, a good answer for what the plan is. Like, I can't imagine you trade him for anything worthwhile. You have three goaltenders, at the NHL level. Are you kicking Mike Smith or Miko Koskinen for stay lock and leaving Skinner, Rod Regan, Kovlov to the minors. That's a choice. Um, putting him in starts over, you know, guys who are going to develop to be goalies in the future, also a choice. So he's kind of in no man's land right now. I don't understand what they're going to do, but that's a problem for them and not us. Um, but yeah, not overall very impressed by Bakersfield this weekend. They got a lot of good favors from Tucson in the form of defensive blunders that allowed them to put pucks in the nets. They got a couple of good bounces their way. Uh, both teams scored off a like weird bounce off an end wall that put their goalie in a bad position to. So yeah, it, it's it's not a game for a team that was a contender that I would have wanted them to have played. Yeah, and uh, I don't know, just having an extra warm body and goal. You know, we'll see what happens when the taxi squads expire. But uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that shakes out. Tucson made a late game comeback in both games, or at least attempted to in both games. Friday's comeback came up short while Saturday's was successful. What was the difference between those two games for Tucson, Mr. O'Brien? Well, if you've been following along for the entire episode, uh, we've said kind of that one team, uh, the difference between team A and team B winning games was uh, when one team made mistakes, the other team put them in the back of the net. When the other team made mistakes, uh, they turned into missed opportunities. I thought Tucson was by and large uh, the team that played better in both games as they made fewer obvious mistakes in total. However, the mistakes that they made on Friday were big. Uh, the Condors took advantage of them, put them in the back of the net. Koliachonik abandoning his area at the net front on the PK to chase Brad Malone along the wall. Condors immediately score. Uh, Kojanas can't control a rebound. No one sees Dylan Holloway over his shoulder. Those are mistakes. They score immediately. Ty Emerson just falls on a rebound retrieval as the rest of the roadrunners, you know, saw him pick up the puck. They're like, oh, this is going out of the zone. They leave the zone. Uh, Condors retrieve, you know, a loose puck there, score immediately. Um, and that's not really on Ty Emerson as a mistake, more of a miscue due to bad ice, which I will say the ice conditions in this game, in both these games looked atrocious, but trying to put down ice in the middle of the desert, probably a difficult task to begin with. So six of one, half a dozen of the other. When the Condors gave up quality scoring chances, though, on Friday at least, Staylock came up big for a lot of them, which is not something you get to say a lot for a goalie who gave up four goals and I think an 8.85 save percentage, somewhere in that neighborhood. Um, but Carcone robbed a few, time on, a few times on Royal Road one-timers that Staylock was able to stay with and track. Chaz Radikop had a beautiful scoring chance on a pass from behind the neck that Staylock managed to get a hold of. On Saturday, the Roadrunners continue to just not be able to finish scoring chances despite heavily out-shooting and heavily out-chancing the Condors through two periods. 
Um, it took a fluke bounce off the glove of Konovalov to get them on the board. Then another kind of freak bounce to tie it. Like it's kind of one of those, the, the gods of hockey decided that they were due for some good bounces after just not being able to put in a lot of quality scoring chances. Don't get me wrong. The road runners continue to look lost in their defensive zone, especially Koli Achanik, who is awful in his own zone and defending uh, rush chances. He had one where he gave Cooper Marodi quite the social distance space uh, in gap control, which is bad. Um, those problems have plagued them all season and don't seem to be improving, which is especially concerning because, you know, they're probably practicing these things. Uh, so that's worrying for Jay Verity and his staff that the defense continues to just look like, huh? I'm supposed to be where? What? There's a go- Oh, that's not that's not a good look from the Roadrunners in their own zone, and it's been one they've been doing a lot. And surprisingly, it seems like it's more the forwards than the defensemen. Although, as I just said, Koliachanik, a lot of times throughout the weekend, just a lot, me sitting there hitting a pause and saying, what are you doing, buddy? Um, I want to go back to the ice conditions real quick. Okay. Because one, yes, ice in the desert, problematic you know can can be a bit of a struggle sometimes but if the 2014 renovation that the tucson convention center aka the tucson arena that the roadrunners play in it the the highlights that it says here on wikipedia include new bathrooms lighting seats a revamped sound system a new kitchen and video scoreboard do you know what i don't see in there an ice plant an ice plant a new ice plant and guess when professional hockey started at the Tucson Convention Center, the mid seventies. Sorry, oh, okay. I, say, <laughs> I think it was seventy six because I looked this up not that long ago. Yeah, the Tucson Mavericks of the Central Hockey League played one season, and so like if if you've been retrofitted for for ice making capabilities since the seventies, I mean you hope that maybe in the nineties they got a new ice plant or you know something like that. But I mean for crying out loud, like. We tried gifting him a new arena. You want to talk about earlier gifts getting lost in the mail. Maybe uh, <laughs> that's another one. But I, I mean, digress. They, Go ahead. They weren't the only team this weekend that looked like they had some sketchy ice conditions. I, Off the top of my head, I don't remember. But there was another one of the other weekend series that we covered. I want to say it was Milwaukee hmm. where, like, the ice conditions clearly were not great. There were a couple of times where guys just kind of fell of their own accord. And you don't usually see that from professional hockey players. Guys just kind of looking like they got sniped. Um, it, it's it's usually bad ice conditions. Um, but yeah, Tucson definitely not having great ice conditions this weekend. Um, and that played a factor, but both teams have to play on the same sheet. So it kind of balances out. But at the same point, it doesn't make for good hockey and it's something if you're a player you know when the ice sucks and it it's annoying but there's nothing you can do about it at that moment and at least the other times that we've covered tucson and we've been to tucson quite a few times this season already uh Mm -hmm. digitally at least um (laughs) the ice doesn't seem like it's been a problem in the past so maybe this was just a a weird one-off weekend uh that happened but not not a great thing when you're struggling to make ice in the desert which i'm sure is already hard enough Right. Speaking of the skaters, speaking of the players on the ice, Sean, who stood out to you on an individual level this past weekend for Bakersfield and Tucson? On the Condor side, I like Konovlov's game, but his glove hand still concerns me. Uh, It's the same thing we said last time when we talked about him. Um, He holds his glove really low in his stance and doesn't seem to have the hand speed to recover. Two more goals this weekend beat him on glove saves uh, on Saturday. Yes, one was a little fluky, but does that happen if he has a stronger glove hand? I don't know. Still, he made a lot of big saves. I like the rest of what I saw from him. The athleticism and his ability to stay with play and read play was some of his strengths we highlighted in the preseason. Those really started to shine through as he's adapting to the AHL and the speed of the game a little bit better. Not that it's necessary, but I'm going to reiterate it anyway. uh, Bakersfield Condor fans, enjoy Dylan Holloway while you can. This kid can absolutely ball. He will not be here long. I would be mildly surprised if he finishes the season in Bakersfield. If he does, it's because Ken Holland actually gets developing young players in the AHL, correct? It's like the only GM thing Ken Holland still does well. 
but at least he has that going for him, which is nice. Uh, <laughs> on the Roadrunner side, we've pumped his tires, I think, every single time we've talked about the Roadrunners, but Matias Michelli continues to just look more and more mature than what we saw from him in junior or in Liga. Um, I never saw him hustle on a back check in juniors or Liga. I did it twice this weekend. Uh, <laughs> it seems like he's going to be a future Coyote and at least a middle six one, which if you're the Coyotes, you need all the help you can get right now. And the fact that he looks to be part of the solution and not the precipitate is a huge bo boost for them. <laughs> Doyle Summerby played a good weekend too, which is not a sentence I thought I would say on this podcast. Um, jumped a passing lane in the offensive zone, turned it into a scoring chance, and was one of the few Roadrunners defensemen who looked moderately competent in his own zone throughout the weekend. I'm as surprised as you that Doyle Summerby was that guy, but that's what I saw, and that is how I'm going to report it. Uh, good for him. It's always good to see you know guys who maybe are a little under-recognized uh, get some love, but he impressed me this weekend. Matthias Michelli, uh, you mentioned him maybe being on the Coyotes sooner than later. Are we talking the Arizona State Coyotes? Are we talking those <laughs> ones, right? Oh, sorry, I, I couldn't cannot believe it. that's a real thing. Like it is a real thing, but I still like it. Feels like an Onion article every time I see it. You know, and I get, I get Gary Bettman. You know. In the 90s, the Canadian dollar was down. That's why Winnipeg left. That's why the Quebec Nordiques left. Atlanta leaving again in the early 2010s to go up to Winnipeg, you know, re repopulate that market with an NHL team. I don't know what the hell is going on. Like, he has such a vested interest beyond all comprehension in keeping an NHL team in Arizona, in spite of the fact that they may not have a viable NHL arena next year. This is going to be worse. Like we were talking about Tucson playing over at Arizona state, not the coyotes. Yeah. I think if they end up playing in the 5,000 seat arena, they will be the first NHL team in NHL history to play in a smaller building than their minor league affiliate. Wow. That's that somehow feels very coyotes. <laughs> it's, <laughs> And I, I at least want to say one thing here. The problem with the Coyotes and their attendance, their fan base, all of that is based on two very simple things. Number one is garbage ownership. Mm -hmm. I mean, I thought the when Alex Morello bought the team that that was the answer. Like this was going to be a guy who helped the Coyotes establish themselves as part of that community that was dedicated to winning. And nope, no, it's not. Uh, and the other thing too is they've been terrible. Like you can't go into a market that is a quote unquote non-traditional hockey market and be bad for like 20 years. You can't, you can't make that work. They need to win at some point. The Coyotes haven't won a play, haven't won a playoff series in what, 12 years, 15? Like it's, I don't even remember the last one. And you're never going to have success in any market, no matter how much they love hockey and have that happen. And that's been the problem with Arizona. It's not, oh, the people don't like hockey or sports fandom is incredi incredibly culture-based and malleable. That's why NASCAR is popular in some pockets of the United States and not others. There's nothing to do with whether the sport is entertaining because that's not objective. It's subjective. Hockey can work anywhere in the world, just like NASCAR or soccer or whatever. F1. Yeah, the price point for it hurts, you know, that availability. But, like, hockey is struggling in, in the desert, not because Arizona is not conducive. Like, Vegas is also a desert in the same, you know, general region, and they're doing great. It has nothing to do with the, the market in Arizona. It has everything to do with the ownership and the team's ability to win games. Nobody wants to go to a game and watch their team get schooled 6-2. to two. Boise, Idaho is high desert. They have had a minor league hockey team there since 1997. 1996, rather, was their first season. 96, 97. Guess who holds the North American pro hockey record for most consecutive postseason appearances? The Idaho Steelheads. 
I was going to say the St. Louis Blues, but sure, I'll go with that. <laughs> well, what did that have to do with Idaho? I don't know. Yeah. But, and- like, it's I, – I always hate that. Like, oh, hockey just can't work there. That's not true. And that's a stupid take. Yeah. Yep. Everything you touched on, ownership, um, you know, advertising, how you're handling the team, community involvement. I mean, yeah, all of those things play a key part in that. So – Sorry for getting and, off track, everybody. But no, 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 and the same thing happened in Atlanta. Atlanta had yeah. owners that hated each other from the minute they bought the team, and the team won zero playoff games in their their time there. They only made the playoffs once, and they got smoked by the Rangers in the first round. Like you need a team that at least has some success, and a team that is well run. And the Coyotes haven't had that in years. Atlanta pretty much never had that and that's why they failed and uh yeah for some reason gary bettman's like nope got to keep a team in the desert got to keep a team in arizona anyway moving on sean uh where do both teams go from here what do we have to look forward to with the condors and the roadrunners bakersfield heads to the difficult part of their schedule uh that they have awaiting for them in february as we alluded to in the preview episode they host the red hot colorado eagles this upcoming weekend, then host Henderson the weekend after before having a Valentine's Day date with Ontario. Uh, all of them should provide us with the necessary litmus test of is Bakersfield really this good? Um, we will know the answer soon. Uh, <laughs> not as easy as a stretch. Uh, and yeah, like I said, we're going to learn how good the Condors are here. Tucson does the opposite. They head on the road to the struggling San Diego goals before finishing a four and six in Abbotsford. So, Condor is going home to host good opponents. Bakers are Tucson going uh, on the road to play struggling opponents. Um, if Tucson has any hope of building momentum off that comeback win, they certainly have some runway to do it here. So hope springs eternal. <laughs> All right. Well, this is the final break as we go into what is to be the cream of the crop and the quiz. So, yeah, we're going to talk about the best players of the weekend in the cream of the crop, of course. And then Sean is going to test my knowledge. We're going to do the time warp again. So I'm looking forward to that. If you're just here for Tucson and Bakersfield, though, we do. Thank you for stopping by. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you're listening to us from so you can get episodes in a timely fashion. You know, we kind of do a two-parter here, you know, weekend preview, weekend recap. So yeah, it's nice to, you know, get both of them combined together. Subscribe and you'll get notified of that. Uh, Don't forget to subscribe wherever you're listening to us from, as I mentioned. Check us out on social media. Links to our social media as well as links to our YouTube channel and popular podcast links can be found on our Linktree page at linktr.ee slash the Calder Farmstead. Uh, We are going to uh, see if we can get Sean's uh, visa for staying in Canada as long as he has. And of course, that costs money. So got to run some ads, uh, advertisements as it were. So we shall be back very, very shortly. All right, my man, Sean, up in Canada, up in Quebec, yeah, oh yeah, look at my Quebec Nordiques hat, you like that? It's time for the cream, time for the cream of the crop, off balance, off balance, doesn't matter, nobody does it better for the AHL Players of the Week, Sean O'Brien, Macho C.C. Oakley, yeah, can you feel the madness, Sean? Oh, I bet you can. Oh, I feel the madness, and the madness definitely... Uh, helped Connor Ingram of the Milwaukee Admirals. He is my first cream of the crop this weekend. Stopped 62 of 63 shots this weekend for a 984 save percentage. Uh, picked up two dubs and a shutout. Doesn't get too much better than that for a goaltender. Connor Ingram, Milwaukee Admirals, my first cream of the crop for the weekend. CC slash Macho CC, who is yours? Well, I'm going to stay there in Canada. I'm going to talk about Joseph Plandisi, but he plays for the Toronto Marlies. And I tell you, the Marlies are in the midst of a nine-game road trip. Plandisi chips in the first two goals of the game, three minutes apart. He said, I got you for three minutes. Bonesaw is ready. Oh, yeah. Got him in the steel cage. But yeah, the first two goals, three minutes apart in the latter portions of the first period. He adds an assist on the empty netter in the third. And you've got his first three-point effort of the season and a 5-1 to one Toronto victory. They finished the month of January 8-3-1. and one. Not 
too shabby for the Marlies. Joseph Blandisi, my first cream of the crop. Wow, freak out. My second cream of the crop is Sheldon Rempel of the Abbotsford Canucks. Uh, four goals on the weekend. Scored the game winner against Manitoba on Saturday. A four-pointer and a game winner. Pfft, hard to beat that. That is my second cream of the crop. Sheldon Rempel of the Abbotsford Canucks. All right, cream of the crop number two. It's going to be Anthony Richard of the Milwaukee Admirals. Well, at least before today, before he got traded to Tampa Bay and he's going to play in Syracuse. But hey, the Admirals had to keep the momentum going this weekend and Richard helped them do it. Game-winning goal in overtime against Rockford on Friday and the opening and by default, another game-winning goal against Grand Rapids in a 5 nothing route on Saturday. The ads are now on a six-game win streak and they find themselves fifth out of seven teams in the Central Division. Oh, bon voyage, Mr. Richard, heading to the crunch, heading to Syracuse. But hey, he was playing with Milwaukee this weekend and he gets my second cream of the crop. My third and final cream of the crop. Uh, hard to go with anyone else here, despite all the hat tricks that have been scored in the past two weeks. I'm going with Nathan Walker of the Springfield Thunderbirds, uh, who started to become a frequent flyer here on the cream of the crop portion of the show. Four goals and an assist uh, for five points on the weekend. All primary points. His goals are automatically primary points. His assist was a first assist. He basically beat the Le Lehigh Valley Phantoms by himself. Uh, that gets you to be the number one cream of the crop for me for the weekend. Nathan Walker, Springfield Thunderbirds. Macho Sisi, who is the top for you? Well, with the Royal Rumble this past weekend, I'm going with Arvid Soderblom. He faced a multitude of shots. You could see as many shots as you did contestants in the men's and the women's Royal Rumble. I tell you what. So 31 saves on 31, or sorry, 31 saves on 33 shots and an overtime loss against a hot Milwaukee team on Friday night. But then to start again on Saturday and shut out the third best team in the league in points percentage, I'm talking about the Chicago Wolves. It took a shootout after a 0-0 score through regulation and overtime. Soderblom only let Stefan Nosen pot a goal during that skills competition. But hey, he had a 36 save shutout, 67 saves on 69 shots on goal in two games. Nice. Arvid Soderblom. My first, well, I guess he's my third, but he's, oh, he's the creamiest of the crappiest. Oh, he needs a Slim Jim. Get him all the Slim Jims. Oh, yeah. Oh, Slim Jim, not a sponsor of the show. <laughs> <laughs> they should be, though. I mean, with, with all Macho right. CC making an appearance, yeah. <laughs> we have a quiz for oh. Cece here. Rare. We, we haven't gotten to work in a quiz in a little bit here. Uh but we do have one today. Oh, yes. And uh, while Sean gets that set up, um, yeah, there you go. You're all set up now. We've got we audio. all set up. We are yes. ready to go. Yes. Uh, let me test this here. Make sure you can hear our lovely sound effects as we of are course. going to play an old favorite, the Time Warp. <laughs> As always, uh, if you are new to the time warp, this is how the games work. This is how the game works. Uh, I will give CC a series of time warps where I will give him a year, and then he will pick a year, and I will give him two teams that theoretically could have played in that year, and say, and give him a player, and he has to tell me which side of that game that player played for. This is trickier than you'd think, because the Absolutely. AHL, as we learned today, features a lot of guys that change teams <laughs> here and there. Yes. So, CC, now that 19 or that uh 20 is firmly in the rearview mirror of 2 years ago, they are added to the time warp. So you have any year between 2013-14 and 2019-20 to go. Where are we going in time, CC? I guess we're going to go back a couple of years and go 2019-20. The year is 2019-20. The Wilkes-Barre Scranton Penguins are playing the Springfield Thunderbirds. 
What side is Ethan Prow on? Oh, Springfield Thunderbirds. Final answer. That is correct. I forgot to mention, we have seven of these. You need four for the dub. All right. One down, Up three to go. On the board already. CC, where in time are we going? You have all of the years still open. Yes. Let's go back to 1314. Wow. Dialing mm. it all the way back. Whoop. The year is 2013-14. The Utica Comets are playing the San Antonio Rampage, a game that definitely happened. <laughs> What side is Jacob Markstrom on? San Antonio Rampage. Final answer. You are two for two. <laughs> All right, CC. Still, I mean, just live and jiving over there. Yes, sir. Every, every year still open. Where would you like to go next? You need two more to win. 16, 17. All right. The year is 2016, 17. Hershey is playing Bakersfield in a very game that happened for <laughs> sure. What side is Brad Malone on? Hmm. I'm going to say Hershey. Final answer. Oh, CC three for three. Like you can't see these, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, my, I, I made it a point to lift up my hands and put them at my side. Put your hands on your hips. <laughs> yes, that's exactly oh. what I did. All right, Cece, three for three. You're looking for the first perfect score quiz uh, in our history here on time. Oh, don't jinx it. Don't jinx We're, it. Oh, I'm trying to jinx it. Don't, <laughs> do, you're not my supervisor. You're not my supervisor. 1718, sir. 1718. The year, the season is 2718. The Ontario Reign are playing the Texas Stars. What side is Michael Marsh on? Ontario Rain, final answer. Cece, you did it. A perfect slate four for four on the time warp. Well, Cece, as the winner of our quiz, you have 30 untimed seconds. What's on your mind, buddy? Oh, boy. Um, you know, it's uh, – I think it's rather telling that, uh, I don't know, NHL players were not allowed to go to Beijing. And then, uh, you know, the U.S., Canada, Sweden, you know, every international team that is still going to Beijing, you know, they're picking up AHL players and, you know, different – uh, major junior players and things like that. But uh, I don't know. It just, it seems like a very strange precedent that, uh, you know, that P that overseas travel is still going on and, and, you know, NHL players and AHL and the AHL, you know, all-star game was canceled. The NHL all-star game is still happening. So it just, it's a bit of a head scratcher to me. Like it's not really me making a statement, but more of asking a question as what does it qualify and I know Canada's lockdowns are a little bit more significant and, you know, robust as uh, America, United States is going on right now. But uh, I, I'm just, you know, obviously the AHL All-Star Game is going to be in Laval. The NHL All-Star Game, I'm forgetting. Vegas. Where, Vegas. Thank you. So, yeah, obviously. And then heading over to seas to Beijing and there's just so many moving parts and everything. I just, I guess it's more of a question for you, Sean. It's like, help me sort this out. What is, what, what differentiates canceling the AHL all-star game, you know, making the NHL all-star game happen, but Olympic players to, to Beijing is okay. Travel wise. I just, I don't understand it. 
I think probably what caused the AHL All-Star Game to get canceled is the governance in Canada more than anything. As you mm-hmm. alluded to, Canada has had much more stricter, uh, much stricter COVID uh, uh, policies than America has by and large. Right. Um, there are some places that's not true, but overarch- overarching Canada has been much stricter with lockdowns, mask mandates, uh, you know, attendance at games going back down the other way. I think uh, Ottawa and Toronto and Toronto have played, you know, fanless games again. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that was probably the overdriving thing as well as just all of the hurdles to be like for an AHL all-star game that, you know, does well for the market that it's hosted in, but it's not nearly the product that is, is widely viewed as say the NHL all-star game. So there was less of an incentive to make sure no matter what happened, the show went on, if that makes sense. Um, the NHL pulling out of Beijing uh, for the Olympics is a lot more about owners not wanting to have their player. You know, you're, if you're sending a player to the Olympics from your NHL team as an owner, that's a good player. Like, no, there are no scrubs on when we do best on best international tournaments. They're all, you know, top of your lineup guys. And the idea that if they then test positive for COVID and any part of the events, like if they play in the gold medal game or the bronze medal game or whatever and test positive, they're stuck in China for another two weeks. Mm, like mm-hmm. that's a very big, you know, uh, disincentive uh, to not want to send your star players there where then you might come back, let alone should they get hurt in those games. But like they might still be out, you know, for another two weeks on top of the Olympics. Like that's right. – and I thought it should have been up to the players uh, individually to go, but I realized there was no way that was ever going to happen. Um and that's that's a hard choice too. Like going and playing the Olympics and representing your country is a dream for most of those players. So to have to kind of sort through that for your own personal safety and you know the betterment of your family, your career, your health is a really difficult decision for everyone to you know because for some of them like this may have been the year that they had you know the shot to win a gold. That those don't come if you're any country that isn't Canada basically every year. Like if you're Patrick Kane or, you know, Austin Matthews, this might've been the year for you to win a gold medal, but how do you balance that with everything else? That's a difficult challenge. The NHL's all-star production, uh, Nevada, very few restrictions uh, in terms of everything else. And unlike kind of the AHL where it's more of just the direct impact in market, there isn't a national coverage of the AHL all-star game to nearly the same level or the same level of marketing and blah, blah, blah. The NHL does. Uh, This is one of their big tent pole kind of showcases along with the winter classics and the stadium series. So whatever they could do to make sure that that show went on, they were going to do. Um, And there isn't that same threats that you see from, you know, you test positive for COVID in Beijing, you're stuck there for two weeks, whereas you test positive in Vegas, you just go through the NHL's regular protocols. Everything's like, everything is kept in house in that sense. You know what's going to happen. Um, And sending a handful of your best players to Vegas is really not any different than sending them to the rest of the Western Conference trips and all that stuff that you've already been doing. So really you're not, endangering your players in a way that will, you know, and the NHL owners profit off of the all-star game and the marketing and all that stuff. Whereas there's been a long thing with the Olympics and back and forth and blah, blah, blah. We're going on a huge tangent here at this point. So <laughs> let's, let's call it at that, uh, at that juncture as a satisfactory explanation. Um, yes. No, thank you for that. I, I think I was comparing apples and oranges a little bit there and just kind of, I mean, it's it's a, a useful a useful question to ask just because it seems like on its surface level like all three of these things carry covid risk but not quite all of the same and the incentives for the owners who ultimately control a lot of what happens uh are not equal and they're going to go with the ones that make them the most money at the end of the day because hockey is still a business um correct right well with all that said that is it for the show Thank you for watching and or listening. The Calder Farmstead is part of the Full Press Radio Network. You can listen to this and several other great hockey, sports, and hell, even pro wrestling podcasts, programs at fullpresscoverage.com. Just click the podcast drop-down menu in the top right portion of the website. It's a big list populating. And enjoy. And of course, thank you for enjoying with us with all of Full Press Coverage's and 
the other hockey podcasts out there. We appreciate you guys spending a little time with us. And if you're enjoying the Calder Farmstead, uh, please make sure you subscribe so you get episodes in a timely fashion. Uh, also, if you are listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Amazon, please rate and review the podcast. Or if you're watching on YouTube, uh, like the video and comment what you thought of the episode. Doing so helps others find the show and your reviews help us improve it. You can also follow the show on social media where we do the memes at Calder Farmstead on Twitter, at the Calder Farmstead on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, all of our social medias are not the same, by the way. Uh, we post different content on each of them. Some of them go out to all of them. Some of them are only Facebook. Some of them are only Instagram. So it kind of helps to you know follow us on all of them so you make sure you're seeing all of the fun stuff that we do everywhere. Uh, links to all of that and more can be found on our Linktree page at l-i-n-k-t-r dot e-e slash the Calder Farmstead. Big thanks to Adrian Drake who made our theme music. You can find him on social media at ad underscore dysfunction. That's ad underscore d-y-s-f-u-n-c-t-i-o-n. So he can make music for you too. Cece, where can people find you? Well, my name is CC Hockley. You can find me representing Full Press Hockey on Twitter at FPC underscore AHL. Uh, broke the news on those couple trades that happened today through there. And you can find me at my personal Twitter account at CC Hawk. That's S-E-E-S-E-E-H-A-W-K. Mostly hockey tweets. Big surprise there. But hey, I love music. Love pro wrestling. Love films. You know, pop culture. Hopefully if it keeps me interested, it's not going to be bullshit for you. Check out my writing on the Full Press Coverage Network at fullpresshockey.com. Enough about me. Sean, where can the people find you? I'm Sean O'Brien. You can find me on Twitter at Sean O'Brien81. That's S-E-A-N-O-B-R-I-E-N-8-1. I'm also on Instagram at Sean O'Brien underscore 81. Uh, both of those are personal accounts. Uh, the Instagram less about hockey, more about the stuff that is just kind of happening around me. I've started doing a... Uh, running uh, Instagram story of Jersey of the day is I have mm -hmm. a, amassed quite a collection of hockey jerseys and I wear them to work every day, uh, including today where I had the Syracuse Crunch jersey on. Um, so you can go check that out there. My Twitter uh, tweets about mostly hockey, but some other stuff as well. Uh, all of my stats work, the PDO things, that point shares model, the game predictions, all of that can be found on Tableau at Bit dot l y slash data dump and chase all lowercase all one word cc take us home all righty that will do it for episode number 79 of the calder farmstead ahl podcast for my cohort sean o'brien i am cc hockley and that will do it for the show and as always keep your stick on the ice